you got your Bibles this morning, I'm going to preach this morning out of 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, talking about holiness. How many like a good sermon on sin? Amen. Come on, amen. Really? Okay. <laughs> amen. We're talking about holiness this morning. Um, probably isn't the most feel-good message that you may heal hear this year, but it might be the best for your soul that you hear. And I, uh, again, I say last week, and again, I say today, this is this is a message that I, as I prepare and put it together, it's this isn't a 101, but I believe this is something for you believers. We believers, as we continue to press in on our Christian walk, and we need to be reminded that our God is holy, and he calls us to, to live a life of holiness as well. And, and for the context of this, Paul is describing the times and the seasons of the last day in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, and I know um, um, it's going to be up there on the screen here directly. But let's get into the Word of God, and it says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Man, this can, this can preach, couldn't it? They'll have a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power. And the Bible says, and from such people... Turn away. It's just to avoid those people. Father, we ask you for your grace and mercy. Lord, we'll never say that we've arrived until we stand before you and we are completely see things face to face. We repent daily. And we ask you, Lord, if there's things within us, and I know that there are, that you would purge those things. And I know there are things that aren't right. But I know through the blood of Jesus you can make them right. And we ask you for grace, mercy, revelation. And Lord, let us not reflect upon our brothers' and sisters' sins, but let us look upon our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Paul's preaching a description of those who are living in the last days. It seems pretty sad, doesn't it? It seems bleak, almost hopeless. And Paul has written this letter approximately the year 67 AD. And here we are in 2021, much further down the road. I can't say that um, things have gotten much better, can you? It's so true that if Paul would have written this about last week, he would have hit the nail on the head, wouldn't he? If he would have described a lot of things in the world we live in today, it's almost can cause us to lose heart if we're not careful. He's trying to, Paul's trying to encourage Timothy, but yet at the same time he's prophesying. He's trying to warn this minister, but he's prophesying of how things are going to be. Because there's really not any difference in people, and there's a spirit of the age that's trying to come out against the church. And Paul sent this letter by pen. He didn't click on a send button. He didn't try to re-pull back his email or anything like that. But he penned it and wrote it to Timothy. But I believe we could see this today. And as I read it, I, I read it as a warning for the church today because I believe that the church sometimes needs to be reminded, and we need to sound the alarm, and we need to, to ring the bell and warn ourselves again that these sins that at one time were simply hidden in the hearts of men and women, and they're now being flaunted from the rooftops, aren't they? There's no shame anymore about things people do. They, they take photos of them, they talk about them, they brag about them. It's it's almost seeing who can, who can be the most disrespectful, who can be the most abrasive person. And they, they do it intentionally for the, for the clicks and the likes and all those other reasons that I can't comprehend. But even the last day church, 
the Laodicean in Revelation, it was prophesied that this church would be all over the church. They would be searching and trying to find a God, groping blindly. But the Word of God would tell us that they were neither hot nor cold. They were missing God primar primarily because of one reason. They had forgot their first love. They had forsaken their first love. And so I, I read this not as a, a judgmental letter or a, a verse, but I search my own hearts as, as I read, or my own heart as I read this. And if Paul were here today, I wonder what his sermon would be about as he would stand before us and preach the gospel. Would it be on prosperity? Would Paul preach about walking in favor? Would Paul preach about us living our best life now if he was to stand here today? And I'm, and I'm not throwing stones at any of those message, but I just wonder what would Paul say today? The Apostle Paul, if he climbed a pulpit, I think we know what he would say, don't we? <laughs> I think Paul would return to the foundations of a whole, holy living. Maybe talk about separating ourselves from the world and being a holy people, wouldn't he? There would probably be much conviction in the tone as the Holy Spirit would purge our hearts and we would have a reverence for Paul. But I'm telling you, one greater than Paul is before us right now and that's the Spirit of God and that's Jesus Christ. We know Paul had a revelation of Jesus and I think we could stand to use a fresh revelation as well. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, I'm not going to read it, but he was caught up into the third heavens. And there was something that Paul saw that transformed him. He had an experience that changed him for the rest of his life. And I know that so many times we believe if God wants to do something, he'll do it. But there's really something to be said about us seeking after God again with a fresh passion. And, and you can get caught up in this, and I'm not going to go too far with it, but we can say, well, if I'm doing the work and I'm seeking him, isn't that me and my works? But there is a part of our faith that calls us to action. Faith is a verb that calls us to seek after God, to long after God. And if we truly say we want more of God, there has to be a place where we press in to get more of God. Paul would probably preach something like this if he were here today and put it in my notes. The gospel of Jesus Christ is worth contending for. Yes. I believe Paul would preach that there is a heaven to gain and still a hell to shun. I still, he would preach that old fiery message, wouldn't he? Yes. He would remind us, like Jesus Christ said, that what profits a man to gain the whole world if they just lose their soul? Yes. What would a profit? No. He'd preach us Christ crucified and Christ resurrected with the fire of Billy Graham shaking his hand over the podium again. He would preach those messages, wouldn't he? Yeah. My God, we need to hear a few of those to be stirred. But I tell you, if we'll dig in deep enough out of our belly, that word will rise back up. Yes. Paul would preach, die to self and submission. He would preach, contend for your faith. Fight to keep your faith alive. Fight to keep the fiery embers burning inside of you. Fight for it. Don't allow the distractions of the world to pull us apart. He would, fight, he would preach to us not to let the devil get a foot in our door and abstain from even the very appearance of sin. And one of the many warnings Paul gave us was about living an unholy lifestyle. Paul preached a lot, didn't he? He, read, he wrote a lot. He penned a lot about an unholy lifestyle. And I thought about this and I thought if a lot of people today have different ideas of what unholy means. When, just that word unholiness, an unholy lifestyle. There's a thousand different thoughts as I'm seeing little bubbles pop out of minds right now. <laughs> Bloop, bloop. I'm seeing, I'm seeing everything from Amish wagons. To, <laughs> but I, there's common ideas. Let, let's look at some common ideas. We would say, hey, fornication seems wrong. Adultery, murder. That should be on the top of the list, right? Mayhem, manslaughter, pornography. What about theft, fraud, lying, drunkenness, smoking dope? vandalism, those things, that doesn't seem very holy. That's pretty common, right? But other ideas in this room would, would be all over the chart from how long do we pray? Are we praying? 
How much do we read? How, how often do we attend church? How much are we giving? How do we dress? How do we look? And it's interesting how we define holiness, isn't it? Let, let's, let's unpack it for just a second. Because if we all had a top 10 list of what's unholy, and no cheating by using the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Side note, I heard a pastor say, of all the Ten Commandments that are broken, you know which one is broken the most by Christians? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Yeah. I know, that's, that's, that's good, isn't it? I wish I'd have thought of it. But God did it way ahead of me. Amen. <laughs> but look at our top 10 list, mostly due to our life experiences and our interpretation of God's word. Some would be due to lifestyles and the people that have taught you and instructed you, pastors and Sunday school teachers and all those things. They play a part in what we believe is holy. And others might define it as personal convictions. For me... Maybe, or for you, what you watch on your television would deem you as being unholy. But for someone else, maybe not. Maybe where you go and the people you hang out with, the jokes you tell. There's a lot of differences in what is holy. I'm not going to cover all those, thank the Lord. I might get into some meddling and, and um, personal opinions, right? <laughs> And I, I bet you're thankful for that, because I might just talk about something that you find as a pet little project. <laughs> but let's look at biblical instruction, amen? Look at Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus gave us two instructions on living holy. Yeah. Let's look at these. Verse 37, is, Jesus says to him, he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's three areas. That's who we are. Our heart, our soul, our mind. Love God with all those areas. Love God with your heart, your soul, your mind. And if we can put God first in every area of our life, yes. the question will be, and Robert, you picked up on it yesterday at Culver's, yeah, if we'll put God first in every area of our life, how can we possibly live unholy? I want us to ponder it because it's a big if. You know, it sounds small. Well, if, if we'll do that, but it's a big if, isn't it? If we really thought of God first and ourselves second, it's a lot to tackle, a lot to ponder. But inside of loving God and putting him first, we will truly eliminate all debatable, even the justifiable, unholy living lifestyles if we can really put God first. Oh God, help us, help us to, help us to strive at least. Help us to attempt. Help us to work on it. Anybody ever take guitar or piano lessons and you had to start somewhere and keep working on it? Yeah. Keep working on it. Keep working on loving God and putting him first. Because here's why it's hard to live like the devil and seek God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Yeah. It's hard to do it. It's hard to watch and listen to filth on our TVs when we've been seeking God, isn't it? Yeah, come on. This is the part that gets good and juicy. Yeah. It's hard to watch filth. It's hard for a man to look upon a naked woman on his TV screen when he's seeking God first. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to wink and okay at profanity on your television screen. Whenever you're seeking God first. Yeah. It's hard to gamble your money when you're investing in the kingdom, isn't it? Yes. I know it says $13.9 million, <laughs> and it's only going to cost you one. I'm telling you, if you believe in the kingdom of God, it's hard to put that over your $13.9 million over yourself because you put God first. It's, it's just hard to do. It's hard to miss church when you're praying for his presence. When I'm seeking and I'm longing and I'm hungry for his presence, it's hard. And I'm not meddling. I'm telling you, when we really do these things, it makes it difficult. It's hard to lust after other gods when we're truly in love with Jesus. 
It's hard to, to, to live a lifestyle that has sin laced within it when we're hungry for God. It's not easy sinning whenever you've looked upon those nail-scarred hands and those eyes of love, when you've envisioned what that cross looks like, and you've got face-to-face -face with a bleeding Savior, and you've looked into those eyes in prayer, and you've seen those nail-pierced hands. It's hard to keep on doing what you're doing. It's hard to curse when your mouth, with your mouth when you've been blessed in your life. When you can look over your days and see how good God's been to you and how he's kept you and how he's protected you. It's hard to curse a God like that, isn't it? I hope it is. It's hard to check out during worship when you're longing for more of God. Amen? Amen. Well, that's not the song I really like. Is it the God we really like? I know there's some, if you put the right song set together, man, the presence of God. Whew. Because it's the song said, I like God. Because this is really more about how I feel. Come on. It's really more about how I feel and, and that song touches me than about the worship that I give to you. Because when we say that, what we are doing is putting ourselves above God. But he says, if you'll seek me first, and if I'll put God first, it's a hard if, isn't it? I'm telling you, it's a hard if. This is why Jesus said, if we'll seek first the kingdom of God, we won't get caught up seeking after things of this world and the world's kingdom. And I just encourage you to, since it's not about us, look at somebody around you and say, seek first the kingdom. Amen. <laughs> seek first the kingdom. But Matthew 22 goes on. Because I didn't want to get into all these opinions. I wanted to get into God's word. Verse 39, and Jesus says, and the second commandment is like unto it. Hang on, buckle up. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. And if we keep this command, we rule out many, the, we, the bottom six of the Ten Commandments, right? They're all about how we treat people. The top four about our relationship with God, the bottom six. Yeah, come on. Well, I mean, I mean, the evil actions of murder, we don't go around killing people, do we? That's kind of frowned upon in the church. Don't murder people. It's kind of a general rule. We don't like people that murder people. We kind of, we don't, you know, if, you, if you're going around killing people still today, you need to stop that. Adultery is not real popular in the church. Women sleeping with other men's husbands. Men sleeping with other men's wives. It's not popular. Fornication. Stealing's not popular in the church. Fraud's not. Lying's not popular in the church, is it? Y'all okay? Yeah. Okay. But these things seem bigger to us than the prior things do. You know why? Because they're against us. These things are against us. It affects me. It affects you. And if it offends us, it becomes a bigger sin in our eyes. See, we could sit and say, well, murdering's pretty rough. But look at the other commandments. Taking God's name in vain is pretty rough. They were all in the ten, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Keeping the Sabbath holy. At least keep them one day a week holy. <laughs> you know? I mean, but it, when it comes against us, it's much larger. See, gossip is big when it's someone talking about us. Dude, like if someone's just kind of talking, you know, stop it. That's not real cool. But if you're talking about me, I'm not real happy about that. And when they're talking about you, you're not happy about it. You catch my drift? Yeah. When the sin is against us, it becomes bigger in our eyes. I prayed with people whose spouses have committed adultery and it was ca catastrophic and it tore them apart and they said it's like my arm was severed off of it with no anesthesia. The pain was so deep but I didn't feel that pain praying with them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it wasn't my wife that did it. And so we don't see the magnitude of a sin until it impacts us. Racism and discrimination is huge. When it's coming against me. Yeah. Just a real quick, because the, we're like 99 point white in this room right now. We are only noticing racism as much right now because it's, it's flipping and shifting a smidge. And white Christian males are kind of targeted, so it becomes noticeable more so. 
But we didn't really pay much attention whenever the comments against, you know, uh, people would say, well, you know, the black guy over there. Well, there was only one black guy there. Or why, why doesn't he have a name? And it didn't offend us then, but it offends us whenever they talk about the white Christians, men, now. Do you see what I'm saying? The offenses aren't bad when it's against someone else. We're like, ah, you know, that's just kind of how they are. It's kind of how the conversation's always been. But when we, it comes against us, so I never thought much about discrimination until I got discriminated on my a job because of ministry works on my resume. And I knew how it felt firsthand. Sins are harder when they are against us. Let's be real. Can we, can we just be real? When they impact us. See, lying is a little white lie until someone misquotes you. And then it's a sin. They need to be cast out of the church. They need counsel with the pastor. They're lying on me. I never said that. It's not a big deal. No, it is a big deal because it was a sin against me. Speaking negative about others is just sometimes how people were raised. No, 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 my friends. It's witchcraft. Can we put it in context? There's life and death in our tongue. And when we are speaking negatively, talking about people, we are releasing principalities, I truly believe, into the air. that We are doing the devil's work for them. Amen. Pastor, can you preach something like my best life now and tell me how I'm going to receive? The Bible says bitter water and sweet water can't flow out of the same spring. I can't sit here and say, I, tell, I love the Lord God Almighty with all my heart. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Did you see what George was doing? There? That George, he, I tell you what. Do you, you, you get my drift? That's sweet and bitter. And it wouldn't affect anybody else in this room near as much as it would affect George. Because I'm releasing a spirit against him of destruction. And it might be because I either just, he reminds me of somebody or because I feel like he's encroaching upon my territory. And there's something that comes up inside of me to attack him. I think that's pretty good preaching, but I'm going to press on. Amen. Jesus listed this as number two, and this is a pretty short list, right? It's profound. Loving people like ourselves means putting them first. And I, I love the conversation we had with the men yesterday talking about boundaries, and there are some limitations. There's some good things here. But, but I believe we knew, truly need to be mindful of how people feel, and what they need, and not just focused on me, myself, and I. I mean, it's pretty popular, me, myself, and I. I know how I feel. I know what I'm thinking. I already know what I'm thinking for lunch. I know what I'm thinking for this afternoon. I know what I got planned for this week. I am very concerned with myself. But this lack of love in the church has caused the church to get labeled as hypocrites. Hypocrites. Ouch. Nobody wants to be called a hypocrite, do they? But the lack of love is what's caused, caused the church to be called hypocrites. Paul might have called it unholy. Jesus would have flat out called it sin. I think we have to look around and tell people to love others. Amen. Amen. Hey, man, why don't you just tell somebody, love other people. Come on, come on, love other people. Hey, Amen. Someone's like, man, I ain't saying anything to anybody because I know he's going to get me later. I am not. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the laws of the prophets. This is tough, isn't it? Let's be honest. I'm not trying to hit anybody. I'm not, I'm not snipering out against anybody. I'm not shotgun firing the gospel, any of those things. But this is a short list. I'm glad I have a Savior. I got myself in this, okay? I pinged me. I shot my own foot in this message, all right? I'm glad I have a Savior. I'm glad He covers me. I'm glad He loves me when I was lost. I'm glad He has grace. I'm glad He is taking me from glory to glory. There are things that I, I have regretted since I've started pastoring and preaching. There's things I've done. There's actions I've done. I die daily. I have to repent daily. And it's just an ongoing thing. And, and I, I give you this final point here today because it's unholy living as a seed. Is seeds that are planted in the spirit of Antichrist in the heart's mind. Paul was talking about the spirit of Antichrist. I'll, I'll move through this quickly. 
He's talking about the spirit of the seed, a spirit of Antichrist. And the seeds enter into our heart and mind. Now follow with me. It's an unholy spirit. It seeks those who do not or are not protecting their heart, soul, and mind. This wicked and sneaky spirit looks for people daily who are not mindful just to plant an unholy seed inside of them. It leaves and allows the seed to grow up and do the dirty work. I tell you the truth. Our words are so powerful in people's lives. I bet if we was to stack it up, we could all recall a wound that someone spoke into us at one point in time that they would not remember that they did. They did the devil's work, didn't they? But that seed grew up inside of us. Sometimes it grows up into bitterness, anger, frustration. Some people call it a chip on your shoulder. It gave you an edge. It, it propelled you forward. But it did its work. And these seeds come in, and, and these seeds will always grow up. And if they're not plucked out, hewn down, and unintended on a regular basis... They begin to produce an unholy fruit. An unholy fruit. A harvest in the lives of people. Last verse here. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It says, now the works of the flesh. I, I want to say this is the works of the flesh, okay? I want to talk about the spirit and then we'll be done. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies. Outburst of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the times past, that those who practice like an Olympic athlete, they practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is the fruit of the seed of Antichrist. This is the, pro the production is what we do in our flesh. But everything that manifests in the flesh started in the spirit. I truly believe it. If you look at these lists, I'm going to flip them real quick. Adultery in the spirit are those who are disloyal to God. We've called ourselves Christians at one time, but then we became disloyal to God and we became more loyal to other gods. Fornication in the spirit are those who are intimate with the world. I love come to church and it's all you can do to sit through a Sunday service, but man, I can't wait for Friday night. I can't wait for Saturday. The world is great. That is called fornication spiritually. Uncleanness, those who were clean at one time on the outside, but grew filthy in the heart. It starts in the spirit first. Right. Long before it ever works its way out. You, you don't see babies, Riley back there isn't, isn't talking like a drunken sailor right now. A sailor's walking out pool halls blushing because of what she's saying. It starts in the spirit, right? It works its way into the flesh. It takes some time for this to grow up. Lewdness is spiritually those who have a foul spirit of negativity and doubt. Negativity and doubt in a Christian, unchecked, will turn into a foul-mouthed, backslidden person. I promise you. You better check those things. Idolatry, those who lift up people, programs, or things other than, more than God. Worship ministers, worship musicians, give them glory over God. Hey, yeah, we don't have Baal and Amalek and we don't have Ouija boards. But I tell you what, if I could just touch the hem of that minister's garment, that's spiritual idolatry. That's where it starts. And unchecked, it grows. Sorcery. Those spiritually, those who are the puppets of Satan. Wolves in sheep's clothing is what we call them. It takes time, but they are exposed. Hatred. Spiritually, those who grew up in bitterness, and it chokes out the life God intended for them. Contentions, spiritually, are those who argue with God no matter who the messenger is. I don't care who says it, I don't want to hear it. I'm going to argue with it. Jealousy, spiritually, are those who are unquenchable lust for things they don't have and don't want anybody else to have it either. That's mine. It's jealousies. So it starts in the spirit before it'll ever work to the flesh. Outburst of wrath. Spiritually, these are the antagonist in the church. They ain't happy and they don't want anybody else happy. Anybody ever know what an antagonist is? Yeah, okay. Y'all sticking with me this morning? 
All right, well, let's go. Let's press. I'm almost done. Dissension spiritually, those who so discord in the body of Christ. See, it's all right. We're talking about everybody else's sins, isn't it? But when we start digging real deep, heresy, those who deviate off the narrow course and take others with them. That's heresy. Envy, spiritually greedy for more power control. That's the spirit of Judas. Murder. Spiritually, those who attempt to assassinate other children of God. With their words. It doesn't, you know, we don't kill people. We just, we just want to take them out from where they're at. You know, let me tell you about that pastor across town. He ain't no good. I've heard what he's doing. You know what I'm doing right there? I'm a spiritual murderer. It's an assassin. It takes time, but over that bitterness will just creep up and destroy me. You got to check your own fields. Am I saying these things don't ever come into me? You got to daily examine, daily. Yeah. Drunkenness. Yeah, we're not drunk with wine, but we're intoxicated with the desires of the flesh. We think about the things that we want. Revelry, spiritually, those who have a life as if God's word is false. I know his word. I know what it says. But I just don't believe it. I'll come to church, but I struggle with my faith. And instead of dealing with it, talking with God, we let it go and fester. And it works into the flesh. And then once it's in the flesh, Paul says, in the like of which beforehand I've told you in times past, those who practice, because this is what it is, it's practice, Practice makes perfect. <laughs> Those who practice such things, allow them to grow up in them and do nothing about it. Don't deal with it. Don't, hand, don't head on deal with it because it's somebody else's problem. I'm better than everybody else. Those people who allow it to grow up will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I am done. I'm closing. I'm finished. I just, as the watchman of the church... I want to remind you not to be asleep and allow those seeds to get planted in. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Yes. Be mindful of other people. Don't allow small things to grow up on the inside of us. Let the Lord search our hearts. Repent that we might be clean. If there's anything in me, Lord, I'm almost positive there is. I'm almost positive there is. I don't always have the best thoughts. I don't always have the best... I don't always wake up on the right side of the bed. I think it's right, but it's not. <laughs> Man's right in all of his ways, isn't he? But, but let the Lord search this heart. I could tell you, I have to repent. I have to seek him. And through all the, the works and through all these things, it is truly only going to be through the acceptance of Jesus Christ will I ever be holy. And I will stand before him and he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful. You're like, how in the world is that possible? Because it's through the blood of Jesus that we've made, been made righteous. I'll never be good enough on this side of heaven, but only through the blood of Jesus. And that's only how you'll make it as well. Because if we allow these things to grow up, they'll affect and infect who we are.